All right, everyone, thank you so much for coming to the RFID talk. Um, this is going to be a quick introduction to how RFID works and uh, what you can do to, you know, play around with it, uh, have, have a little fun, and hopefully it will, uh, we will end with some suggestions on uh, how we can make RFID a little bit safer and what the common problems are. And then we're going to end with a quick demonstration on how to use the uh, the Flipper Zero. I'm sure y'all are very familiar with that. Um, if not, we're going to introduce you to that as well. So, oh yeah, before that, introductions. My name is Ege. That's spelled like that, uh, the top name that you see over there. Uh, we're from the Physical Security Village. Uh, if you see, like what you see here and would like to see more of the physical side of, uh, like physical security side of DEF CON, please be sure to come by the village. Uh, it's going to be in the map, and also we're going to be... You can just walk around and look for people wearing weirdly green shirts. All right, thank you. I'm Andrew Marchment. I'm the second name on there. Uh, I work in the store of the Physical Security Village in the vendor area. Uh, we're very happy to have partnered with uh, uh, the Keyport uh, guys this year to offer a discount for people buying Keyport key organizers. And we're also uh, partner with Covert Instruments to offer some of their inventory at our store. So if you've seen them lock picking lawyer or McNally and you want some of those tools, uh, we are retailing them at our store. So come by later. Uh, my background is in satellite telecom. So I'm more of a high frequency RF guy, but uh, I'm doing this talk today on uh, how to use the uh, Flipper Zero and other RFID cloning tools and, and how RFID works. So uh, we'll get started. All right, so yeah, RFID, sorry about that false start there. Um, RFID, we see it all around us. Uh, we see it whenever we uh, tap our uh, key fob to get into our building at work, we, when we tap our badge, whenever we go on transit and we use one of those contactless cards, um, or even when we pay uh, with either, uh, you know, tap with your card or Apple Pay or uh, Google Wallet or whatever. Um, but something that we don't necessarily always think about is how these darn things work. So. You want to run us through it? Sure. All right. So it's basically a transformer that you're making when you bring your card up to a reader. So the reader has a coil of wire, and we're passing an electrical current through that uh, coil at all times. As that card approaches, we're completing the circuit, and the magnetic field that comes around that original coil induces a current in the coil inside of your card and that powers a little chip in there that actually allows it to respond to the um, reader with its ID. Yeah, so um, this is kind of a simplified view of what the inside of one of those tags looks like. What it basically does it, it is it draws more or less current to send a one or a zero. There are other ways as well, it gets a little bit more complicated, but on the very basic end of it, this is what it looks like inside, and what that looks like if you, you know, were to measure the uh, magnetic field around it is the magnetic field is either high, you know, like you see how those like pulses, um, or it's a lower magnetic field uh, measured because the chip is loading that magnetic field, drawing energy out of it, and that is, it's talking to the transmitter. So something obvious that you might realize is this is very easy to mess with. If I bring my own loop of wire around it, and that's actually how I capture that image that you just saw around, uh, that they just saw before, I'm able to just read that communication. It's literally just a breadboard jumper wire that I looped around a bunch of times, and then I put that near the transmitter and the fob, and I was able to pick up that communication. There's no encryption because, you know, you can't encrypt physics. It's either, you know, more or less magnetic field. Um, and it's incredibly trivial to sniff. Something else is, again, because you can't encrypt physics, and the moment the tag sees the reader, it starts blaring out its ID number, as Andrew said. I can come around with my own reader. Maybe you might have seen this. Uh, this is a photo from... Physical Security Village last year, we have a similar setup this year. If you go near um, the entrance or the exit of the, uh, the village, you might 
see a long range reader um, <laughs> idly sitting by, sniffing your badges and putting them on the, the wall of sheep. <laughs> so, um, how can we solve this problem? Does anyone have any ideas? Shout them out. <laughs> Lasers, I heard. Uh, it's probably going to be a little more difficult to target that, but yeah, I heard someone say encryption. Yeah, we solve it using encryption. So this is how an encrypted communication looks like. Before everything happens, there has to be a pre-shared key. So basically the reader and the card or the fob or whatever and the badge need to be have an agreed upon key that the manufacturer puts on there. And there's a challenge and response between the reader and the fob. And once they have both proven that they both know what the key is without ever saying the key, uh, then they can just use that key to communicate encrypted. But this encryption, uh, this communication is obviously a little bit more complicated than just the raw, okay, I'm loading the field. I'm not loading the field communication that we saw earlier. And uh, because of that and other uh, bandwidth limitations, this is usually seen in high frequency. So 13.56 megahertz RFID. So this, at least in principle, seems pretty perfect, right? This seems like a mathematically secure system, and as long as it's properly implemented, and as long as no one does this inconceivable thing of just putting the same key everywhere, you know, like if, if there was a theoretical, you know where I'm going, right? This is what HID did. They apparently sold and until pretty recently <laughs> continued to sell um, RFID systems that use the same key on every single standard security uh, reader and fob that they sold. The, re uh, the authors of this paper did them a solid by not releasing the key, uh, so they had some amount of time to respond, but obviously did not take that long for the key to appear on GitHub. Um, but as long as you don't, you know, do stuff like that, um, and also there are other uh, vulnerabilities that we've seen just because of time limitations, we can't go too much into it. Um, there are, um, yeah, as long as you implement your security correctly, as long as you pick your random numbers actually, you know, in a decently random way, you can do high security, uh, high frequency RFID in a vaguely secure way. Um, what you ha what happens if you don't do that is what Andrew's going to show next. So yeah, with a demo. All right. Thank you. Let's get this set up. Here is everyone's favorite dolphin. All right, so this is the interface for the Flipper Zero, which is what I'm holding in my hand here. And it has a lovely little interface here with some animations. And it's very convenient for copying your hotel room keys uh, so that you can share them with your friends. But uh, I'm gonna go into low frequency here because that's what the badges I'm holding are. And I'm going to read the orange badge. And we'll see if this is going to work for me. There we go. We have the orange badge. And we are now going to attempt to write this to the blue badge, which already has information stored on it. So I'm not 100% sure if this is going to uh, work. And there we go. So now our blue badge has the same information as our orange badge and will open the same doors. And it can be this simple. Yeah, just to show that it worked. Um, yeah, if we go to read again, and this time we wrote to the blue badge, so if we read, or the blue fob, so if we read the blue fob, it's gonna have the same information. So when we said, or when Andrew said, it's just saying its ID number, this is what we mean. So you see here, there's a facility code, so that's the 25 there, and a card number. So uh, in this case, it's uh, 15686, right? 
So this is just uh, one of our, uh, yeah, it, you don't have to write that down and try to figure out where I live. Um, <laughs> that's one of the test doors that we have uh, at the village. If you want to come by and you want to, you know, plug that into your flipper, you're probably going to be able to open uh, one of the two test doors that we have. So yeah, that's what we mean. It's literally just a four byte number. Um, so something else you can do, the flippers don't support this uh, on the stock firmware, but something else that you can do with it is, does anyone want to say, just uh, yell it out loud, is four bytes a very large key set? No, it's a tiny key set, <laughs> a key space rather. Um, so yeah, you can also brute force this. And, oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, Andrew has. Yeah, I've got the other firmware. Yeah. So this is the HID proc. So this will run through the entire dictionary for HID procs devices. Another common one is the EM4100. Uh, and again, it's a very short dictionary and you can run through this in about 15 to 30 seconds. Yeah, so the main thing that's limiting us here is, again, remember, it's a very passive system, especially for low frequency. The reader has to ask us what our ID is, and then we can reply. So we're limited by the number of times the reader is willing to ask us, but that's usually either one or two per second. So even though that sounds like, you know, 0.5 hertz or one hertz sounds like a very low speed attack uh, or like a very limited, because uh, if you were trying to break a hash, that would be basically impossible, but because it's just four bytes, if you can just like, you know, leave something on there, maybe overnight, if, uh, you know, like after, uh, after work hours, you just go put your device on the reader, you'll leave for a couple hours, you come back, you pick it up, and it'll give you what the, um, what the correct code is. So, with all, uh, kind of a conclusion to this is, when we tap our cards, when we tap our badges, um, or when we, you know, tap to pay, it all seems very magical. It sounds, it, it feels like we're not limited by the same things we are when it comes to keys. You know, like we, uh, a lot of people talk about how if you take a photo of a key, you can duplicate it. If you take, if you leave your key, it can be uh, measured, decoded. And it feels like whenever we're using RFID cards or, uh, you know, key fobs, badges, they feel like they are somehow magically more secure. And in some cases, for specific use cases, it is, but it's good to, rem uh, but it's good to remember that it's not a silver bullet, right? We should be treating our RFID cards the same way we treat, uh, treat keys. Yeah. So if, if, we lose, uh, if we lose a fob, we should do the exact same things that we would do if we were to lose a key. Sorry, we're gonna say something? Yes, I was going to say, treat it like a, any secret, so like your passwords or your door keys to your house. It's exactly the same thing. If you have the secret, you have access. So there needs to be a, you know, good maintenance of your secret. So if you have a building and you have employees who are terminated, you need to deactivate that card. Um, if you have a building that is using an HID card system, you need to upgrade that to one that does does a proper job encrypting the secret when it transmits it. Um, Wygand uh, has, you know, and other formats after the reader transmit the secret unencrypted over the wires to the central server, which controls the building access system. So again, even if it's a proper four way shake between the reader and the uh, badge, someone can tamper with one of the readers and actually tap the wires and intercept the secret there and replay it um, at will uh, to gain access later. Yeah, so just to sum up what Andrew said there, uh, hook up your darn tamper wires. <laughs> if you own a building or if you have a security uh, job or something like that at a building, if you, you can just test this, right? Go up to your fob reader, unscrew the thing off the wall, and if you don't receive a call from your security center, your temper wire is not hooked up. Um, you can work with security companies, you can, uh, you can just, you know, come to talks like this, you can come to the Physical Security Village and we will be more than happy to show you what those temper wires do and how they're hooked up. Um, but yeah, so basically, there's more to... There's more to 
RFID access control than what uh, people seem to uh, see on an initial look. So that's kind of why we uh, do this talk. Also, it's fun to play around with. All right, with that being said, oh, there we go. Yeah, um, if anyone has any questions, uh, please ask us now or you can find us at the village afterwards. Um, oh, also, we didn't talk much about the Proxmark, but if you are interested in getting a Proxmark, you can buy it from Dangerous Things. Not affiliated, not sponsored, anything like that. Also, Hacker Warehouse has them here. Oh, yeah, Hacker Warehouse here has them. Again, not affiliated, not sponsored. Um, and you can go to you can go to proxmarkbuilds.org uh, to get the, you know, the good firmware uh, written by Iceman, and uh, he also has a channel on YouTube if you want to learn more about how to play around with RFID, not just using the flipper, but using uh, more research-oriented tools. Oh, also, yeah, we sell those, sorry. <laughs> yes, I just want to plug our store. We're selling the tags, both high frequency and low frequency. If you need a spare hotel room key, um, that's where you go. <laughs> yeah, for the for the high frequency ones, yeah. Um, yeah, any questions? Go on here. Uh, do we have a, okay, I don't think we have a speaker, uh, sorry, a microphone for the audience, so uh, you got to yell it out. <laughs> yeah, so the question was how easy it is to uh, bypass tamper protections. Um, on uh, on the readers, and it usually uh, depends on the manufacturing of the actual reader. Um, so we did trash their um, standard security. Uh, yeah, we did trash their standard security uh, RFID, you know, um, protocol earlier. But HID actually does a pretty decent job at uh, building their readers, and it's kind of really difficult to get something and you know get a tool in there to keep that uh tamper sensor from triggering but it really depends on the reader um i would just play around with it honestly another question So the question was, um, if I have, so I, I, we said that if I have a long range RFID reader, um, how do I, how does, you know, blue team defense against that? Um, two general ways. One is if you have, uh, they, they make RFID blocking uh, badge holders. Um, also, yeah, uh, there are RFID blocking, um, you know, like, wallet stuff that you can use. So yeah, this is it's an example, uh, not sponsored, just a random manufacturer. Yeah, Amazon. Yeah, from Amazon, apparently. Um, any, honestly, any conductive block of thing will do, it'll drain that energy. Um, or as an alter, uh, well, ideally in, uh, in conjunction with that, you can use systems that are not vulnerable to just being read by any random. So for example, a lot of high frequency, um, protocols will require that handshake before any um, data is communicated. So if the reader doesn't know the key, then you can't talk to each other. Any other questions? Uh, so the question was, um, if I t if the tamper wire is hooked up, you know, if the tamper system is set up correctly, what happens if someone tampers with the reader? Is that, yeah. So um, honestly, it depends on the system. Uh, if you set it up so that you get a special notification saying, because it's, you know, if someone just holds the door open or um, forces a door open or something like that, you're facing, you're obviously, if someone is actually tampering with the device, you're facing a more high skill uh, attacker. So you might wanna, you know, like work with your alarm uh, alarm company and make sure that you get a special notification or a special alarm condition for that. But uh, it, it just depends on the system. Oh yeah, add to that. I just wanna add to that. Um, 
you know, if the alarm system is correctly installed, yes, you will get an, an alarm. However, alarm fatigue is a thing. And if you tamper with it and then set it off and leave and they come around and look at it and then you come and mess with it some more and leave and they come and look at it and then you leave or, <laughs> and then come back, they, they are going to just stop checking and going to turn off that alarm and you are then free to do your thing and, you know, red team it up. So just wanted to add that. Yeah, I've, uh, um, for obvious reasons, not going to go too much into details, but I have used an actual engagements where I would just show up, prop a door open, leave, show back up, prop a door open, leave again, and then eventually security stopped responding. Oh, okay, yeah, I think that's our time. Yeah, that's yeah okay, all right. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, if you have any other questions, please reach out to us by email or uh, swing by the, the village. Uh, to try out some of these and also some more uh, physical hands-on stuff. Thanks.